Continuing Friday the 13th, the Ultimate DVD Collection with Friday the 13th, Part 3, in 3D, at least originally. Before I get into this, I want to give a shout out to the Michael Myers fanatic. He was one of the first people to suggest me doing this series, and one of the people most vocal about it, so I might not be doing this if not for him, so go check out his reviews of horror movies. This happens, this takes place right after the second movie. Another naive group of counselors. No, wait, no, no, that's not this one. The cover says it is, but no, not counselors. This is just a group of random young people. I guess Jason is not that picky anymore, as long as it's his woods. Anyway, they camp out for the summer in a, a cabin, and you can guess what happens from there, because this is a Friday the 13th movie. This one goes somewhat back to the roots, back to the first one. There are several really direct callbacks, excuse me, and while that is kind of meh. This does also go back to the stalking, and it works out pretty nicely except for all the annoying fake-outs. All the times where it turns out to just be someone else who, you know, was sneaking around for whatever reason, or who was hiding, or whatever. The characters are again not that developed, except for for Shelley, who is the obnoxious one, but at least this one, you can kind of understand why. In the first two, it was just a jerk. We didn't really get an explanation why. Here, he's kind of, you know, he fears being ignored. He's maybe not the most popular guy, so he tries to pull pranks so people will at least notice him. We also get a gang, an 80s gang, and you might already know what that means. Ah, the 80s, where every other movie released had a gang, and they were really over the top in the way they behaved. It doesn't even make sense why they're here. They're, you know, not in... This isn't the city, you know, this is taking place in the woods, so what the heck are they even doing there? They also, as most 80s gangs do, dress really hilariously. One guy constantly has a cigarette in his mouth, and the back of his vest has a remarkably plain-looking skull. And it actually does appear to have been, like, Xeroxed and then attached to the back of his vest. It really doesn't mesh all that well. They, they, they're hilarious. And then we have a very brief appearance by a new crazy guy, Abel, in place of Crazy Ralph. And he's, unfortunately, nowhere near as entertaining. This being in 3D, yes, they tried that back in the 80s too. I think they also tried it in the 50s. I haven't watched any of those movies in proper 3D. I've only watched them on DVD. So I can't really comment on how well it looked, but I can attest to that in this movie, they make a lot of effort to shove a bunch of crap in your face. So it's not just now. Isn't that nice to know? Jason finally is now wearing the is finally now wearing the hockey mask, the goalie mask that we know and love. And while they do build him up a lot in this, they do also show him some more and this is especially true of the ending. And yet he is just as terrifying. He's, in fact, 
I would say, of the three, this is the one where he's been the most terrifying. He's just very imposing. They hired the exact right guy for this. A guy who could be on camera for extended periods of time and still be really terrifying. It's all in the performance. He really sells that this guy is really dangerous. You know, psychotic. This one doesn't really add anything to the mythology. It I don't know, I guess they just figured that enough had been done with that. It's basically just people go into his woods and he comes back. And since this is set immediately after the second one, it actually takes place more on Saturday the 14th and Sunday the 15th than Friday the 13th. I don't know, I guess he doesn't really care that much about the date anymore. The filming and editing is still pretty average, but it's not bad. There are some nice reveals. We get more creative deaths, although that really isn't true of all of them. We spend a little more time on the deaths, so it's not, you know, just all of a sudden someone dies and then we move on to the next thing. There's there's also more build-up than there was in the second one. So when someone dies, we've usually had you know, some atmosphere. We, we know someone is around. And although we linger a little more on the deaths, it's not actually, you know, sadistic. It's not pornographic, like in, it often is in current horror movies with blood and gore. The pace is reasonable. I would say that this has the best middle of the first three. You know, as with the first and the second, the beginning and end are really some of the best. But here I would say they also do a good job on, you know, everything in between. The script is still daft, you know, it's still how can we get these young people into situations where they can't immediately get help and they can be picked off one by one. But with that said, it does have some bits that are reasonably good. The acting is, again, not all that great. It's passable, though. The girls are mainly cast on account of their ability to scream. But still, it works out. And that might be more or less it. We do, yet again, open on a recap of the movie just prior to this one, and again, it's not even re-edited particularly, it's basically just the ending, shown again, you know, in case you forgot, in, what, the two years, the one year that, you know, passed between them. But on the whole, if you want a really straightforward slasher flick, this does a pretty decent job. It delivers, you know. Of the first three, I'd have to say it's the one I could most envision myself re-watching. You know, I respect the first one on account of what they did with absolutely no money and the fact that you know it's not well made but you can tell that they wanted it to be good and it more or less 
worked out. It, it does the job, you know. The second one felt a bit like a cashing in on the first one, but in this one, it again feels like they wanted to terrify you. They wanted to give you something that you, you'd be talking with your friends about, you know, you'd encourage your friends to see. And not because, you know, they did cheap stuff that everybody just automatically loves. Well, okay, that does go to the lowest common denominator, you know, but relatively little for how much it could and for how much other films of the period did. More than anything, it's just effectively scary, you know. Jason is truly an image that, you know, remains in your head in spite of him being seen for more than just a few seconds. And I would also say that this has surprisingly little, you know, sexuality and nudity. I'm not entirely sure there's any direct nudity. It's all like, there's very little of it and it's, you know, seen through sheer something. I won't tell you what it is. Anyway. That was my spoiler for review of Friday the 13th, Part 3, in 3D.